Today is November the 13th. Today, we see Paul's defense. Today, as you read through the Bible in a year, please read Acts 23 through 25. All three of these chapters, and indeed the next chapter, chapter 26, are Paul's defense before four different groups or individuals. In chapter 23, Paul goes before the Sanhedrin, the great council. As soon as he realizes he's standing before the Sanhedrin and that it's composed of Sadducees and Pharisees, he shouts out, I stand under judgment because I believe in the resurrection from the dead. Well, that was a key theological issue between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And suddenly they begin to argue amongst themselves about resurrection from the dead. Chapter 24, Paul is brought before Felix. Remember, he is being held by Romans. So in some way, shape, or form, he has to stand before the Romans. When he comes to Felix, he simply talks about his arrest, why he was arrested. Well, Felix hears him, and uh, he says, I'll listen more later, and he puts him back in jail. This went on for two years. Felix would call Paul, talk to him, and then he'd send him back to jail. Uh, Luke says he was looking for a bribe, and this is very consistent with what we know uh, from external uh, sources about Felix. Uh, Felix was uh, born a slave, became a freedman, and eventually the governor of the area. Uh, he was incredibly cruel, incredibly corrupt, and always looking for a buck. Well, in chapter 25, he goes before Festus. Now, this would have put it around 58 A.D. Festus hears Paul, and uh, he's he's a good guy, but uh, he says to Paul, "You know what? This is an issue of Jewish matters. Uh, let's send you to Jerusalem to be tried there." Paul says, "Oh no! If I go to Jerusalem, I will simply be killed. There will be no trial. I appeal to Caesar." Now. Uh, Nero was Caesar by this time. He was uh, newly appointed as Caesar. Claudius, his uh, 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 predecessor, was known for receiving all kinds of legal cases. He viewed himself as a lawyer, one who would mete out justice. So uh, Nero apparently at least continued that on in the early part of his reign. Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. So Paul heads off to Caesar. Enjoy today as you read Acts 23 through 25. Acts 23 through 25, New Living Translation, Acts 23. Gazing intently at the high council, Paul began, Brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Instantly, Ananias, the high priest, commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. But Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? Those standing near Paul said to him, Do you dare insult God's high priest? I'm sorry, brothers, I didn't realize he was the high priest, Paul replied. For the scriptures say, You must not speak evil of any of your rulers. Paul realized that some members of the high council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he shouted, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, as were my ancestors, and I am on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. This divided the council, the Pharisees against the Sadducees, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all of these. 
So there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and began to argue forcefully. We see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or an angel spoke to him. As the conflict grew more violent, the commanders were afraid they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered the soldiers to go up and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. That night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. The next morning, a group of Jews got together and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than forty of them in the conspiracy. They went to the leading priests and elders and told them, We have bound ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we have killed Paul. So you, the high council, should ask the commander to bring Paul back to the council again. Pretend you want to examine his case more fully. We will kill him on the way. But Paul's nephew, his sister's son, heard of their plan and went to the fortress and told Paul. Paul called one of the Roman officers and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something important to tell him. So the officer did explain, Paul the prisoner called me over and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took his hand, led him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me? Paul's nephew told him, Some Jews are going to ask you to bring Paul before the high council tomorrow, pretending they want to get some more information. But don't do it. There are more than forty men hiding along the way, ready to ambush him. They have vowed not to eat or drink anything until they have killed him. They are ready now, just waiting for your consent. Don't let anyone know you told me this, the commander warned the young man. Then the commander called two of his officers and ordered, Get two hundred soldiers ready to leave Caesarea at nine o'clock tonight. Also take two hundred spearmen and seventy mounted troops. Provide horses for Paul to ride and get him safely to Governor Felix. Then he wrote this letter to the governor. From Claudius Lysis to His Excellency Governor Felix. Greetings, this man was seized by some Jews, and they were about to kill him when I arrived with the troops. When I learned that he was a Roman citizen, I removed him to safety. Then I took him to the high council to try to learn the base of the accusations against him. Soon I discovered the charge was something regarding their religious law, certainly nothing worthy of imprisonment or death. But when I was informed of a plot to kill him, I immediately sent him to you. I have told his accusers to bring their charges before you. So that night, as ordered, the soldiers took Paul as far as Antipatris. They returned to the fortress the next morning, while the mounted troops took him on to Caesarea. When they arrived in Caesarea, they presented Paul and the letter to Governor Felix. He read it and then asked Paul what province he was from. Silica, Paul answered. I will hear your case myself when your accusers arrive, the governor told him. Then the governor ordered him kept in prison at Herod's headquarters. Acts 24 Five days later, Ananias, the high priest, arrived with some of the Jewish elders and the lawyer Tertullus to present their case against Paul to the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented the charges against Paul in the following address to the governor. You have provided a long period of peace for us Jews, and with foresight have enacted reforms for us. For all of this, Your Excellency, we are very grateful to you. But I don't want to bore you, so please give me your attention for only a moment. We have found this man to be a troublemaker who is consistently stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the cult known as the Nazarenes. Furthermore, he was trying to desecrate the temple when we arrested him. You can find out the truth of our accusations by examining him yourself. Then the other Jews chimed in, declaring that everything Tortellus said was true. The governor then motioned for Paul to speak. Paul said, I know, sir, that you have been a judge of Jewish affairs for many years, so I gladly present my defense before you. You can quickly discover that I arrived in Jerusalem no more than twelve days ago to worship at the temple. My accusers never found me arguing with anyone in the temple, nor stirring up a riot in any synagogue or in the streets of the city. 
These men cannot prove the things they accuse me of doing, but I admit that I follow the way, which they call a cult. I worship the God of our ancestors, and I firmly believe the Jewish law and everything written in the prophets. I have the same hope in God these men have, that he will raise both the righteous and the unrighteous. Because of this, I always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. After several years away, I returned to Jerusalem with money to aid my people and to offer sacrifices to God. My accusers saw me in the temple as I was completing a purification ceremony. There was no crowd around me and no rioting, but some Jews from the province of Asia were there, and they ought to be here to bring charges if they have anything against me. Ask these men here what crime the Jewish high council found me guilty of, except for the one time I shouted out, I am on trial before you today because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. At this point, Felix, who was quite familiar with the way, adjourned the hearing and said, Wait until Lysias, the garrison commander, arrives. Then I will decide the case. He ordered an officer to keep Paul in custody, but to give him some freedom and allow his friends to visit him and take care of his needs. A few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Sending for Paul, they listened as he told them about faith in Christ Jesus. He reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control and the coming day of judgment. Felix became frightened. Go away now, he replied. When it is more convenient, I'll call for you again. He also hoped that Paul would bribe him, so he sent for him quite often and talked with him. After two years went by in this way, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and because Felix wanted to gain favor with the Jewish people, he left Paul in prison. Acts 25 Three days after Festus arrived in Caesarea to take over his new responsibilities, he left for Jerusalem, where the leading priests and other Jewish leaders met with him and made their accusations against Paul. They asked Festus, as a favor, to transfer Paul to Jerusalem, planning to ambush and kill him on the way. But Festus replied that Paul was at Caesarea, and he himself would be returning there soon. So he said, Those of you in authority can return with me. If Paul has done anything wrong, you can make your accusations. About eight or ten days later, Festus returned to Caesarea, and on the following day he took his seat in court and ordered that Paul be brought in. When Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they couldn't prove. Paul denied the charges. I am not guilty of any crime against the Jewish law or the temple or the Roman government, he said. Then Festus, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? Paul replied, No, this is the official Roman court, so I ought to be tried right here. You know very well I am not guilty of harming the Jews. If I have done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die, but I am innocent. No one has the right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Festus conferred with his advisors, and they replied, Very well, you have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Bernice to pay their respects to Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. There is a prisoner here, he told them, whose case was left for me by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the leading priest and Jewish elders pressed charges against him and asked me to condemn him. I pointed out to them that Roman law does not convict people without a trial. They must be given an opportunity to confront their accusers and defend themselves. When his accusers came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day and ordered Paul brought in. But the accusations made against him weren't any of the crimes I expected. Instead, it was something about their religion, and a dead man named Jesus, who Paul insists is alive. I was at a loss to know how to investigate these things, so I asked him whether he would be willing to stand trial on these charges in Jerusalem. But Paul appealed to have his case decided by the emperor, so I ordered that he be held in custody until I could arrange to send him to Caesar." I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said, and Festus replied, you will tomorrow. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Festus ordered that Paul be brought in. 
Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are here, this is the man whose death is demanded by all the Jews, both here and in Jerusalem. But, in my opinion, he has done nothing deserving of death. However, he appealed his case to the emperor. I have decided to send him to Rome. But what shall I write the emperor? For there is no clear charge against him. So I have brought him before all of you, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that after we examine him I might have something to write. For it makes no sense to send a prisoner to the emperor without specifying the charges against him. Scripture reading from the New Living Translation by Emily Herrera. Like, follow, and subscribe to this devotional on whatever platform you use to listen to it. Email your questions to us at questions at becomehope.com. Tomorrow, we see Paul in Rome.